Thank you for coming to my talk, and thank you, Verica, for a very generous introduction. Uh, this talk will be actually a, uh, some story around what you have heard from Verica, uh, and I titled the quantum equation a window to view some certain objects in a uh, in a new language. Is mic on? Oh, uh, I see. I see. I hear. Would it work better here? Yeah. Or should I just speak up? <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, maybe this is a moment to recap the influence from physics towards uh, quantum information. So I just highlighted some historical uh, uh, landscape uh, in the 20th, up, all the way up to beginning of the 21st century. Uh, the EPR pair, as you all know, uh, it defines a maximally uh, entangled state, and that, that, that is ubiquitous in any information task, and that was discovered by physicists in 35. And then came uh, the Bell's inequality, which uh, uh, distinguished the hidden variable theory versus truly quantum mechanical correlation. And then Feynman said that, oh, the quantum mechanics seems to be so, so difficult to simulate, so it's difficult to calculate about. So why don't you use the quantum mechanics to, to calculate itself? That's the Feynman's proposal. Maybe you could explain that louder because it's somehow still doesn't seem to be. Oh, uh, maybe I should just hold this mic here. <laughs> uh, 
And then came a couple of years later, a completely different context. Uh, Charlie Bennett and Ed Brassard come up with the quantum key distribution protocol based on the uh, based on the, the EPR pairs, namely that you cannot break, you cannot uh, see the correlation before it is broken. If you see it, then it's broken, so nobody can distill the hidden correlation in, in, inside it, and that's the basis of the key, key, key distribution. Then came a quantum, uh, computer science came, comes in to this, to this business, and uh, Deutsch, Josa, and Bernstein Vazirani wrote an algorithm. It's a made-up algorithm. They're practically, they may be of, of little use, but it, it is the first algorithm to, to distinguish what is hard in classical means versus what is hard in quantum means. So uh, technically, the Bernstein Vazirani uh, algorithm uh, tries to find uh, some hidden uh, uh, Num a bit a, a string of numbers that is easy to find for a quantum if you have access to coherent manipulation, but otherwise very difficult uh, by classical means. So there's a genuine difference in complexity, the quantum hard versus classical hard. So that's a conceptual big breakthrough. Then came the, the, the most famous algorithm of all uh, in the quantum computing literature, the factoring algorithm by, by Peter Shore. So, the, so far, well, the, the commonly used the cryptography algorithm, uh, the RSA scheme, is based on this hardness of this factoring uh, problem, which is, will be broken once we have a large-scale quantum computer. Then there's a, there was a criticism about the quantum computer itself. And quantum mechanics uh, opposes, uh, assumes that the underlying quantum state is described by the continuous vector in a continuous vector space. So how can you deal with the noise when the noise accumulates in a continuous fashion? There was, there, there, it, it's, doesn't it like an analog computer that miserably failed? Then came Tior to answer that, that criticism to come up with an error correcting code. Oh, quantum mechanics, yes, the, the state is continuous, but you can discretize the errors. And effectively, whenever you see the system, then error becomes effectively discretized. So you can apply the classical means of error correction, and you can do uh, quantum error correction. Therefore, in principle at least, the quantum computer at scale is possible. Shortly after, people have generalized this scheme, and that is the formalism as we know today as a Pauli stabilizer code, or CSS code, uh, written by, by these people here. It makes a deep connection, well, very simple connection, but deep connection with the uh, Pauli operators acting on the Hilbert space versus the linear error correcting code in the classical literature. And then there's another important theorem comes in from the quantum computer uh, science, and namely the threshold theorem. Uh, your error correcting scheme, the Shor, what, what Shor has shown is some error correcting scheme uh, that suppresses error uh, in an asymptotic fashion, but not fast enough. So the overhead is quite big. But the, and moreover, the, if you follow the short scheme, then in order to do the very long computation, then proportionally your physical error rate has to be somewhat low, too. But the threshold theorem says that no matter how long computation you want to do, your physical error rate can only, should only be as good as certain threshold value. It, it may be a nine, a three nines or a four nines, that depends on the particular scheme. But there's a, some fixed value about which once you achieve it, then you, don't, you, longer, you lo no longer have to improve your physical gates. Your arbitrary long computation becomes feasible. That's the threshold theory. And there's a, um, around a, uh, a similar time, Alessi Kitai have come up with, uh, uh, pointed out that, oh, there is a natural error correcting code hidden in the physics literature. Namely, the discrete gauge theory has been lurking inside the uh, theoretical physics. That is extremely useful when you think about it as an error correcting code. And we will uh, touch upon it in more detail shortly. But there was another criticism. Well, yes, there's a Tori code. It's nice. It's an error correcting code. You can build a quantum computer, but it's, uh, it's, it leaves on a torus. I, I, I don't know how to build an array of atoms or array of <coughs> superconducting qubits in, in a, arranging a geometry torus. So let's make it planar. And that planar version is also possible using the ideas of gapped domain walls between topological phases. That idea comes from the physics side. And you can also study the bosonic systems into which you can encode a discrete, discrete degrees of freedom into a, a much larger heap of space. And for that purpose, there is an error correcting code. So this is a brief history of what happened 
uh, towards the quantum fault tolerance. Um, there is another idea uh, that, uh, that excited us, from, well, that, that excited many people around the world, namely that uh, Mike Friedman said, the threat threshold theory is great, theoretically. Conceptually, it's great. But the problem is the threshold value requires two good physical gates. Maybe it requires like a six nines, but who's going to make a six nines reality uh, gates? That's, that seems too difficult. So let's make use of the physical physics to the very, you know, to, uh, extremely extent. So you just bring the, some particular uh, phase of matter, namely the non-abelian annealing system, then just manipulating the stations in that, in that system will complete the error correct, will complete the quantum computation. And you don't need any further mechanism for suppressing error. That's the idea of topological quantum computation. Okay, let's review. Can I suggest maybe that it's the Maybe that will pick up the one. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I promise that I will review the Tory code in, in more detail. So this is nothing but the discrete gauge theory coupled with the matter field. So normally you would write down the U1 gauge theory with, with the field strength and the Lagrangian like that. But you can discretize the, everything and think about the so Z2 values gauge field uh, defined on, a, say, a square lattice. You can generalize the higher dimensions, but, the, but for the sake of uh, drawing things, I just drew the two dimensional lattice. And since the gauge field is a vector field, I place the degrees of freedom on each edge. The number of components, uh, number of edges associated with the vertex matches the, the, the matrix, uh, the vector field dimension. In this in two dimensional case, it's two, three dimensional, three, and so on. And I define the gauge transformation that map, that converts, uh, the, uh, that, that transforms my gauge field in a, in a certain fashion, and that is local. So it's a local symmetry, a gauge symmetry is implemented, discretized, implemented in this way. You can couple a, gauge, a, a matter field by introducing a scalar field, and the scalar field in this discretized version corresponds to some uh, degrees of freedom on, assigned on the vertex. And the gauge field must also transform that matter field too, so I assign another operator to make that happen. Once you define the gauge transformation, the next job for a physicist to do is to find the gauge invariant operators. So there is a matter gauge coupling, uh, some electric field term, and the flux term. And then I write down a Hamiltonian built out of those gauge invariant operators. Um, here I chose a very boring one. The electric field is set to zero, but I, but I introduced the mass term for that uh, scalar field, but I kept the flux term. So everywhere is flux-free, um, mass is, yeah, is, is non-zero. And I do some simple, let's do the simple transformation. Namely, the, previously uh, I, had, I had these terms. Uh, this, these are my gauge invariant operator, and that, that, that's the operator drawn in the diagram that appear in the Hamiltonian. And my gauge transformation was, was this. But if I do so-called controlled knot gate, it's a four by four matrix in the Z2 case, specific unitary, you don't have to calculate here, but I, I'm just telling you that the calculation is not that difficult. And after that basis change, your gauge transformation looks like a single side operator, as simple as it, as it can be. And then your Hamiltonian is transformed into like this form. The, the, mass, the, the scalar field operator now became a five body operator, and the flux term happens to remain the same. Now, we, since the gauge transformation operator got so simple, I don't want to think about that. So imposing, uh, well, uh, declaring that my gauge transformation is, uh, is redundant, namely that this operator must assume eigenvalue one, and I can just substitute this equation to there and obtain what is known as the Tory code. So Tory code is a code but it, it is lurking in the old literature of discrete gauge theory. So what's so special about this Tory code? Um, well, the most interesting, the, since the Hamiltonian was chosen to be a very boring one, the only interesting stuff is happening at the ground state. So let's look at that. Um, if you look at the Hamiltonian term more carefully, you, you, it's easy to figure out that they are always commuting. Uh, these x terms commute with each other, x, z terms commute with each other. When they overlap, say that this x term is sitting here, then there's al always an even number of overlaps between x and z, so the, the accumulated phase factor will cancel off. So you can simultaneously diagonalize every term in the Hamiltonian, so it's exactly solvable. And the, producing one ground state is easy, just 
chose start with uh, some state that is in the eigenvalue of the, all the all the x operator here, and then apply a projection where the plucket the flux term would take eigenvalue one. You just expand it. That's it. So here's a diagrammatic expression of that expansion. First, I started with the uh, uh, all uh, all x equals plus one state, and then I apply a certain term here, for example. And in that term can appear anywhere in the lattice. So it will be an equal amplitude superposition over all small loop configurations. But there's an interesting thing going on. If I had started with a different initial state, instead of all being plus one, but say the, the, the degrees of freedom on, along this line had a x equals minus one, then still my vertex operator will assume uh, eigenvalue plus one and the fluctuation introduced by this expansion will introduce uh, you know, uh, loop configurations. But topologically, they are different in the sense that on the first diagram, there's nothing going on. Here, there's an odd number of horizontal line going, uh, is always present, no matter how you deform it, because you always end up introducing an even number of horizontal lines by, by acting with the plockets. So, in, uh, summarizing the, this observation, a ground state will be superposition over all topological trivial loops. And uh, because you're adding only top, topological trivial loops, the homology class of the underlying state cannot change. So you get the uh, uh, degeneracy of the ground state that depends on the homology of the overall space. So global, the ground state subspace knows something about the underlying topology of the space. Now, what, why did I tell you all this stuff? Because I, I wanted to talk about the error correction criteria. So let's put the Tory code side. Let's put the Tory code uh, uh, aside and let's think about the trivial code. I want to think about the scenario where I lost some of the qubits and I recover the state back. If you are doing some uh, atom experiments, then you have so say you have encoded your favorite uh, uh, quantum state into some ensemble of say twelve atoms, and somehow seven of them flew away. There's no way to capture them. And still, you are required to reproduce the original quantum state back. How would you do that? So uh, the, that's, a, that's such an a inaccessibility because of the flu flying away qubits. It's called erasure error because you, you are erasing qubits away. And I want to consider the criteria. When can I uh, recover the original state from erasure? So. For, the, for this, now consider the, the trivial code. Everything, all, all but one qubit is in the, in the zero state, so they're in the fixed state. And all the, all the information I care about is encoding the first qubit. You may not call it a, a code, because it's not going to do any help, but let me call it code anyway, that's trivial code. Suppose you lost those, what would you do? Well, there's not much to do. You know what they are. You just replace it with all zeros, that's it. Now, let's look at the equivalent formulation of that error correction criteria. The, the target, I want to say that the erasure of a set of qubits is going to be correctable. And the, the result is that that happens if and only if there is a complete set of logical operator. A logical operator, operator is a jargon in error correction, nothing but the observable on the space you care about. So in the trivial code example, the logical operator will be any operator acting on the first qubit. That's all. There's a complete set of logical operators, operators that avoid the set of qubits that is still going to be lost. If you can find such a representative, then you, can, you are guaranteed that erasure can be recovered. That's the equivalent, equivalent condition. And that, and that condition is easily checked in this trivial code. Well, my logical operator will be supported there. It has nothing to do with the lost region. Yet another equivalent condition is that the erased set of qubits have zero correlation. Correlation in the conventional sense, the connected correlation function, zero correlation with the logical state. Oh yeah, of course. The lost qubits are all in the zero state and they have no correlation with, with this alpha or beta. There's nothing there. And if that happens, then the erasure can be recovered. That's the if and only if condition. Let's test those conditions in, on the Tory code, more non-trivial example. Say I lost those qubits from the Tory code. So some qubits that are supported on this ball-like region, and I want to recover that. 
uh, I want to say that I want to, I, I can recover those states. How can I do that? I can check some of, uh, one of the two equivalent conditions. There's a complete set of logical operators that avoid the set of qubits. Logical operator is observable on the, on the two states you care about. So I, I look at those green shaded area. Can you tell the difference by looking at only at that green shaded area between alpha and beta? Yes, because in the alpha, along this column of horizontal edges, there's always an even number of black colored edges, whereas in the beta, there is an odd number of black colored edges. So you can perfectly distinguish them. And that distinguishing uh, capability amounts to you have an operator that is similar to, that's an logical operator. And that operator did not touch anything about that lost qubit, so the second uh, criteria applies. What about the third criteria? Erased set of qubits have zero correlation with the logical state. In, in other words, the, if you look at only this erased qubit, you cannot tell the difference between alpha and beta. You, you should not learn anything about alpha and beta. And why is that? It is a fluctuating string configuration with the boundary conditions open. So any configuration is possible with, in, in that uh, uh, erased qubit. It has nothing to do with the global topological sector. So the third, the third condition check. I will, I will come back to this uh, criteria several times in the, in the talk. So don't worry if you cannot remember. Um, and these, these conditions uh, gives us a conceptual explanation for the topological excitations. This is a rather exotic notion, but I can define using the error correction criteria. Let me define an anion in the following way. Anion is an equivalence class of excitations in two plus one dimensions determined solely by circumferential probes. What, are, what do I mean by circumferential probes? Uh, you, you should think of the Heranov Bohm effect. Uh, imagine there's a solenoid going on here, and, you can, and there's some magnetic field trapped in that solenoid. But you can tell the, the presence of that magnetic field by going around the solenoid and only knowing that the, the factor condition is non-zero there, even, if, even though the, the magnetic field itself is zero everywhere. So that's my circumfer for, for circumferential probe. And the anion is going to be, I don't care whatever you do in, that, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the regions surrounded by my circumference. As long as I can tell anything by probing circumference, then I, I just label the, whatever is inside to be my anion. So maybe you have heard that anion is uh, some particle that, could, that is possible only in two plus one dimensions with the uh, fractional self statistics. That's a good explanation, but it's extremely hard to work with. You have to define what do you mean by fractional statistics. What do you mean by statistics in the first place? Uh, so it gives us so much headache, so I came up with uh, this rather mathematically looking definition. And it will apply to even higher dimensions in various settings. So it comes with that benefit. So you can understand now what the fusion is. Um, so you throw in some excitation in your medium, and then you probe what is inside by, at some small scale, R. And let's call that, well, I, I have probed my any charge in that small scale, and then uh, and, and, and we label them by here, like a one and one over there in the end of that fashion. I have labeled the local anion charges everywhere. But that does not guarantee what will happen if I probe it at a much larger scale. So for example, if I probe the entire configuration of excitations at, at this bigger block, I don't know what, ha what will happen. That's the beauty of this fusion rule. And Precisely the number of ways that can happen at the longer scale is the fusion rule. That's the fusion. You can also understand the braiding. Um, anion at this, you specify the anion at a smaller scale, and you move it around, and, and, and at, at the end of the process, you annihilate them, and you measure the quantum amplitude. That's the braiding. Inherently, there is no notion of uh, the, well, since I am ignoring the, all the local details intentionally, uh, the, the trajectory of an anion at, at one braiding has, has, is insensitive to the precise trajectory it traverses. Uh, and self statistics is, is nothing but the braiding with itself, uh, nothing more complicated. 
So what does it, any, quantum error correction has to do, has anything to do with anions? Well, I just hinted that anion at scale small r may be moved around whose trajectory is linked with others in space time, but the precise detail does not matter. So let's apply the error correction criteria here to that smaller scale uh, r. The error correction, correction criteria is that there's a complete set of logical operator representatives that avoid the set of qubits that are lost. Excuse me. Here, the logical operator is going to be any probe about the, the underlying state. So the, it's precisely the anion trajectory. The operator that, that teleports, it, teleports the anions, that will be my logical operator. And I said that the, the, the precise location doesn't matter. So, and that is precisely what is meant by logical operator is avoiding for any given region. So the very fact that you, the, the trajectory doesn't matter in detail implies that you, you may, you, you're allowed to lose some local patch of your system. So error correction is built in in the definition of anions. What about the third, third criteria? Uh, the, the criteria reads, Erased set of qubits have zero correlation with the logical state. Here, logical state will be the overall anion in charge, and the erased set of qubits only sees a local charge, but anion that charge is, by definition, is regardless of what happens at local scale. So you cannot have any correlation with the rest. So at small scale, you cannot learn anything about the trajectory. That's the equivalent condition to the error correction. So that's the connection between error correcting codes and topological phases. So let's, let's digress to, to the uh, experimental status. Uh, well, it's a quite a jump from the talking about the anion to the actual experiment. Uh, none of the experiments will, uh, uh, will handle about anions. They typically use very small codes. Uh, here is, this is a notation. The, the first number is the number of qubits involved. The second number is the number of logical space. The third number is the degree of tolerance to the errors. So, and, so the, except for the, with the first number fixed, the, the remaining two numbers, the higher the better. And typical physical error rate in all of the experimental platforms ranges about a few percent down to a tenth of a percent. It's around that order of magnitude. And if you run the experiment loop to measure the, what happens at the logical level, the error rate is also similar. It's around one percent down to a tenth of a percent. They're the same. The logical error rate is not any way smaller than physical error rate. That's the status currently. But you may wonder, you're using like nine or seven or five qubits in total. And you say that, oh, my gates are like, a, my gates are faulty if you try 100 times. You only get one fault. That seems way too good, that your gates, given that you're using only like a five or seven qubits. Why is the experiment so hard? So here's the back of envelope calculation. Say we have 10 qubits. Yeah, we do have 10 qubits. And to encode any logical information, we probably need to uh, check a certain number of operators that is comparable to the total number of qubits. You have to check whether there is an error or not, right? That there, there, there should be a check operator. And now here comes the tricky part when it comes to quantum uh, error correction. You have to measure those check operators coherently. You should not reveal the underlying state. You only have to see the logical, uh, I'm sorry, the check information only. So you have to apply a certain unitary gate and then measure. So that involves some, some number of gates, say five. Then five times 10, check 10 operators I, I have to measure and there are five gates involved. So 50 possible 50 gates, you need that. 50 possible error locations. You will, be, you, you, are, you, you design your experiment in such a way that you are always correcting one error. If not, why, why are you doing it? So one may, error may get corrected, but not two. Two errors may get, may corrupt your logical state entirely. So you have to take, you have to correct that. So five choose two, that's around like a thousand. So a thousand, a possible way to errors that could go wrong. And maybe your clever decoding algorithm recovers the entire state regardless, half the time, say. 
then that brings us the logical error rate to be 500 times p squared. It's just the probability. Uh, num number, of, number of ways for things go wrong is quite high. And if your leading term in the error formula is like that, then the break even point is like, like 0.2%. That matches the current status. And there are further co complications when it comes to logical experiments because logical qubit is, is meaningful only in relation to others. If you give me just one logical qubit that lives for 100 years, I don't know what to do with that. You need at least two, the more the better, of course. And so, you know, comparing, the measuring the one logical qubit's performance is not that meaningful. So you have to define something operationally meaningful, but that task is always overall architecture dependent. So if you want to compare platforms, then you have to, well, to be really rigorous, you have to start with the overall, oh, here's my overall architecture I'm gonna bring down. Here's my, therefore, my elementary logical operations are such and such, and these are improved and that much and so on. That's the rigorous way of doing logical, measuring logical performance. And none of the experiments are that scale yet. Okay, that's the one digression to the experiment. Um, now, let's think about, as a theorist, was there a question? Uh, yeah, let's think about uh, more theoretically. Well, okay, now the, the air question is just so hard, but maybe we can do better by thinking harder. So here's a, let me pose a question. Does there exist a phase of matter for quantum memory? What do you mean by that? So suppose I start with some small system and I encode it word code. Then I wait with the interaction with the heat bath for tau memory time. And then maybe one bit is corrupted. Code become coke. The one letter got flipped. And then when you read it, read it out, you, you recover the original code. Okay, that's fine, that's good. And you measure the maximum time for this given system size that this is possible. You increase the system size, you throw in more degrees of freedom, and hope that your many body effects helps, helps us. So you want this memory time to be much, much larger as the system size grows. Eventually, I would like to diverge with the system size. Does that, is that possible? That's the question. When you, are, when you pose the question, you have to dig up the literature, and the old literature has an answer already. So I, we talked about the Tori code in the two plus one dimensions, but you can generalize the higher dimension. And uh, the Wagner's original discrete gauge theory uh, explains that piece too. Uh, you can go to higher dimension and consider uh, gauge transformations associated with the even smaller subdimensional uh, uh, stuff. And there, the degeneracy is topology dependent in greatly in four plus one dimension or higher, you can find uh, a, a particular limit, limit, limiting phase where you can remove all the point-like charges. You're only left with the uh, fluxes. And they are, since they are flux, at the <coughs> sufficient low temperature, they are all confined. So they, they do not proliferate and they remain very small. And you can analyze the memory time in this scenario and, and prove that the memory time actually scales exponentially with the system size. Great, we solved the problem. But there's a problem, again. It's four, maybe too high. Can we, can you, can you, can we bring it down? Um, so for that purpose, I resort to the very definition of error correction. The error correction criteria reads that there must be a complete set of logical operator that avoids any given finite set of qubits. If I could achieve that, here finite means that it doesn't make use of any boundaries, so it remains some small relative to the system size. If I can achieve that, then I would have a good error correction proper, uh, property. That's the criteria. But this criteria does not refer anything to the topology. And all solution we got so far has something to do with topology. Maybe topology is not the answer. Indeed, uh, Chamon uh, wrote down a, a model, not particularly motivated by, 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 by this question, but at least this model rules out the quote-unquote existence of topology in, in, a, in a model. 
it's a very simple uh, lattice model. So cubic lattice with the uh, uh, qubit, one qubit per site. And the Hamiltonian term is a, a six-body coupling. Uh, poly x, poly x, poly y, poly y, poly z. And arranged in a geometric fashion. And he claimed that, oh, this behaves a quantum glassiness. Later, Bravi, Linhuis, and Terhal reanalyzed this model and calculated a, a peculiar formula. The ground state degeneracy, if you take the log, then it is given by the greatest common divisor of the linear dimensions of the lattice and under the periodic boundary condition. How come there is a GCD in this local model? I didn't demand that. And, there's, so, and that, that, that indicates that this model has less to do with topology of the underlying space. The topology of the underlying space is just a torus. It's a mundane torus. And it, it is error correcting code. So in that sense, it exhibits a topological order. And because of this degeneracy formula, it's nothing like a discrete case theory. But it, now you ask the same question about the quantum memory to this model and you find that it is not good for the quantum memory purpose. So the game is not ended yet. So here comes the, my uh, work. Um, I consider the uh, three-dimensional lattice model with the four-dimensional degrees of freedom per site. And I coupled eight qubits arranged in a particular form. And then I, 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 I propose that Hamiltonian be the sum of those this translation invariant system, but no rotation symmetry. And it has a number of interesting features. Uh, it is a exactly solved Hamiltonian because every term commits with any other. And there is a degenerate ground state, so you can encode some number of qubits inside. And the ground state observable, the logical operator, the operator you need to distinguish any two different ground states needs to be supported on a geometrical shape whose dimension is greater than one. Now, if you're familiar with uh, any topological uh, field theory, then it's three plus one dimension. So the minimal dimension operator that lives in this space is always one. Now, it requires greater than one. So there is no analog of with line or operator. Um, it is dual, you can dualize this model, and it, you, you find that it is, uh, it is, uh, it, <coughs> it is dual to a, a, a theory with the self-system symmetries. It is an enriched symmetry, some, sits somewhere between internal symmetry, the global symmetry versus uh, the one-form symmetry, or higher form symmetry. It sits somewhere between. And still today, there's no known field theory description. And that's a... Uh, uh, somewhat tantalizing uh, 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 fact that it, it is a kind of doctrine that field theory should emerge as a low energy effective theory for any lattice Hamiltonian. But this is a mundane looking lattice Hamiltonian. Why can't there be any field theory description? There's a good reason for that. Let me come to this. And now, yes. What, what does the Z, I, and Z, Z, these different labels mean? Oh, uh, so each site is occupied with the two qubits. So Z refers to poly Z, and I means that it does not act there. Yeah. Okay, so these sums are black hat. Sums are over cubes. Cubes? Yeah. Each cube representing eight of the Z's out of the 16. Yes. Okay. Yes, in that particular fashion. Okay. Uh, so let me tell you first the phenomenology of, the, of this model. There is a point like particle. But the motion, the quote-unquote motion, requires the following operator. I'm separating excitation here from that. So um, the overall configuration is neutral. I'm creating the overall configuration from the vacuum by applying an operator on that blue uh, uh, shaded uh, uh, sites. And it is separated in that fashion. You can bring it to the, to the other direction, for example. And if you combine it, if you squeeze it into one corner, then because it was neutral overall, it must vanish the vacuum. Yes, indeed. So this is the combination of the operator you need to make it move. Yes. In the ordinary uh, uh, lattice model discrete case theory, you would just write down a line operator. That's it. Here is more complicated. But this is an operator which has some factual. Um, Dimension, because it's hierarchical structure, or is it dimension? Is it like a plane, a surface? Uh, so the it is a 
So it is an error correcting code. So an observable or an operator must be able to avoid any given region. But when it avoids, it does not just deform as in any other topological object. It deforms in a very specific way. So the point is that, the, yeah, the, all, all is this is a consequence of this. There is an antiparticle you can call because, you know, you can talk about the overall topological charge, but antiparticle of a point-like particle is never point-like. It is an extended object. And that's the, that's the most interesting feature of this. Um, put, it dif put it differently, a uh, point-like particle sitting here versus point-like particle sitting there they represent two different topological sectors. There's no matrix elements you can write down that connects the two states. So let, 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 let's recall the definition of an anion. Anion was an equivalence class of excitation in two plus one dimensions determined by circumferential probes. The same uh, 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 definition applies except for that dimensionality. There is a topological charge in the sense that it is an equivalence class of excitations determined by the circumferential probes. In that definition, there's something non-trivial going on about that particle, but it's never like uh, any other ordinary theory. What about degeneracy? Um, under the periodic boundary conditions, it is always a power of two by design actually, because it's an error correcting code that's constricted in a specific way. But that K depends on the overall system size by that formula. It's worse than the previous GCD formula for the Shamong model. It's you, you expand these polynomials in T. T is a formal variable. L is the my system size. Uh, omega is uh, some third root of unity. And then you expand these polynomials, take the GCD of that polynomial, read off the degree, and that degree tells my, my, my number K. And for a specific value, if the linear size is power of two, then it generally grows linearly. But if you add just one more side on every, on every direction, then it drops to constant. It's very irregular, very non-continuous. And this is a genuine graph of that K formula. Um, so this is a one piece of evidence that it, it will not have any field theory description. How would you reproduce such a complicated behavior depending on the UV detail using field theory? Another evidence I will give that requires entanglement RG. So let me tell you what entanglement RG is using the Tori code. So it's, it's a simple transformation. So there is a, the uh, usual ground state wave function. There's a vacuum a loop inserted here. It's all superposition over all possible configuration. And you apply certain disentangling transformation. You apply some unitary in order to disentangle some of the qubits away. And if it is disentangled, you just drop it. Then at a coarser scale, you, you find the exact same ground state, but only the lattice constant has increased. And you can do it over and over again. Then you, you obtain uh, uh, this scale invariant uh, uh, description of the state. The, the right-hand side is a caricature of the tensor network that describes the, the given state. So this is the in entanglement RG. Now, let's do the same thing for the cubic code. Here's a, a caricature of the ground state wave function of the cubic code. Here's one copy. I apply certain disentangling and then discarding transformation. And I recover the same thing at a coarser lattice. The lattice spacing has now increased by a factor of two. But there's another thing. Okay, well, that can happen. I mean, you're doing RG, so some, some other stuff that you didn't input may appear, of course. But if you do the similar uh, transformation again to that extra unwanted one, then you discover the two copies of itself at a coarser level. So this closes the calculation. Now, you know, as you go down to the IR regime, uh, uh, everything is now reproducing. There's a bifurcation. And that is consistent with the degeneracy formula. Degeneracy for powers of two, it, it is exponentially growing. So where does that growing uh, degeneracy would come from? It, it should come from some other theory, and that other theory happens to be itself. So if I were to uh, draw a similar caricature as I did before, what, 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 where, where, where my tensor network would leave to represent this uh, entanglement RG, 
I would draw like this one. Well, maybe this is not that visually helpful, so I drew another version. So the upper edge corresponds to my original 3 plus 1 state, and the vertical direction is my RG direction. And because of my bifurcation, I need one more extra dimension. So the natural space where the tensor network description leaves is two dimension higher, not just one dimension higher. That's, this is another reason that uh, field theory discussion would not exist. Okay, now let's come back to the original question. Does that work as a self-correcting quantum memory? Does that, is, is, is that robust to the thermal errors? Well, the answer is kinda. <laughs> uh, so we have proved uh, the, the memory time uh, prove the, the lower bound to the memory time, and this is the formula. V is the volume of the of my uh, overall system, and beta is the, my inverse, temp in inverse temperature. So very small beta, the de denominator is negligible, it's, uh, it's order one. So it grows initially as system size grows. But at, at some point, the denominator takes over because it's exponentially growing rather than algebraically growing. So exponential, the, the denominator takes over, so lower bound vanishes in the, in the large system size limit. Of course, that doesn't mean that memory time is vanishing, it's just a lower bound vanishing. So we, do, we ran some numerics to test that whether that uh, lower bound is anyway close to the reality, and it seems, yes. So there is a, some cutoff system size where memory time is maximized, and that uh, cutoff system size is growing with the inverse temperature. Um, but the upshot of all this is that it is not divergent. Memory time is still some bounded by some function set by the temperature only. It's a little bit better than just the Boltzmann, inverse Boltzmann factor, but it's anyway a finite number. So what's the status for, the, for this problem? Um, there's an upper bound for, the, for this kind of Hamiltonians that bounds the memory time. And it's given by uh, some growing function of the system size multiplied by what is called the maximum energy barrier. How much energy do you have to put to map from one ground state to another? In other words, how much energy does the environment have to put in, into the system to, to corrupt, to mix all the ground states? And that enters in, the, in, the, in this Arrhenius uh, uh, law formula. And I had a theorem that for all translation invariant code Hamiltonians, this energy barrier is at most log. There cannot be anything bigger. So plugging this into that formula, you get the polynomially growing, algebraically growing function of system size, never exponential. But it's still growing. Upper bound is growing, so it's not completely ruled out of divergent behavior, but so far nothing is found. But is, that the, is this bound bad because it's three dimensions. If you went to four dimensions, it could be yes. faster. So the log yes. v is the three dimensional. Right, variable. right. So, so sort of the marginal, three sort of marginal. Sort right, of right. It, it's the, the, the bound is interesting because of three. Um, and uh, there is another claim that, claim result that the self-correcting quantum memory in the, in the, the, the very uh, uh, way I, I, I formulated exists if you impose very strong form of symmetry. But without that symmetry, it's still an open problem. Hmm. Anybody step map could help here. Um, okay. Now let's change the subject and let's talk about the quantum LDPC codes. How many minutes do I have now? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, what the LDPC, that's the mouthful acronym, but it stands for low density parity check codes. So what is it? Um, if you draw a graph, bipartite graph, between qubits and checks, and then you draw a line whenever checks sees a qubit. So for example, this qubit is checked by this check and that check. And this check will go into probe this qubit and that qubit. That qubit. So you, 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 draw, you draw this graph. And whenever the degree, the number of lines emitting from one vertex is a small number, then you say it is an LDPC code. Um, uh, and one important parameter in the all error correcting code is the code distance. It, it does not determine everything, but it's one important parameter. It's the smallest number of qubits that you have to corrupt to do anything. So the higher, the better. 
the high means that you have to corrupt many things to corrupt the entire logical information. Um, and when it comes to LDPC codes, there's a, a bit of an interesting history that uh, the, the Tori code, the dis discrete gauge theory in two plus one dimension, was standing as a highest distance possible for any given LDPC code of a given length for a long time. There was a marginal improvement by a log factor by Mike Friedman and others. And almost 20 years later, the log factor got improved, but the square root n stayed the same. And then we broke that square root barrier, right, replacing that 0.5 to with 0.6. And surprisingly, like a three months later, another group of people come up with almost linear distance, and that's the optimum possible. So, so the 2020 is a, is a very interesting year for the quantum LDPC codes. So what to do with the LDPC code? There's an interesting uh, geometry going on here I want to talk about a little bit, and then I will, I will have to conclude. Um, so there is a notion of systolic freedom. It's, just, it's a completely geometric notion. Forget about all physics for that slide. So what's the area of a square? It's L times L, linear times linear size. Why, why do you even ask me? That's, a, that's <laughs> elementary school math. For closed surfaces, the two-dimensional manifolds, the length of an essential loop, you, you take a, a topological non-trivial loop, and then you measure that length, and then square it, and divide it by the total area of that surface, then that ratio is by, bounded by some constant depending only on the topology. That has been known. If you go to higher dimension, then you may wonder about, oh, let me take a you know, total volume in the denominator of uh, some manifold, and then some uh, minimum volume surface or some, some sub-dimensional thing in, the, in, in P dimension, and a complementary dimension, let's take another minimum dimension, and multiply them too. And you wonder about the, what's the ratio of, the, of these two. Surprisingly, for dimension greater than two, three, four, five, six, and so on, this ratio diverges. There exists a family of metrics for a given uh, uh, manifold in, in such a way that total volume is so small compared to the subdimensional volumes. Well, what's the definition of essential loop? Oh, just a top of, yeah, there are many versions. Uh, typically, you just take the non-trivial non homology one. Yeah. So there's many. Yeah, there are many. There are many. You, you, oh, you, 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 you minimize it. Um, so the word systolic freedom refers to the following phenomena. Systoles, the shortest non topological non-trivial loop, the volume or the length or area of that subdimensional thing is not constrained by the total n-dimensional, top-dimensional volume. That's, that's the systolic freedom, it's called. The degree of the divergence, the, the, the rate at which this diverges, depending on the number of uh, uh, triangles in, in your manifold triangulation, is kind of mild, uh, but let's get to that uh, in a moment. And good LDPC codes gives an instant interesting phenomena here. Um, it gives a stronger systolic freedom. Uh, Friedman and Hastings constructed a manifold out of codes. It's a bit uh, uh, esoteric because it's uh, 11 dimensional manifolds, not, not that low dimension. But anyway, some, some constant dimensional manifold, 11. <coughs> Such that whose uh, systole volumes at dimension four and seven, so you take a sub-dimensional uh, uh, manifold of dimension four, and you take, and you, you take a non-trivial one, calculate the, 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 the volume of that four-dimensional sub-manifold, and you keep it somewhere, and you take a similar calculation for the seven-dimensional one, and you multiply them, divide by the total volume. Um, then, using the good LDPC code, if you proceed using this procedure, then the, these multiplication becomes the square of the full volume. It's like a, you, have a, you had a square whose area is L, not L squared, when the linear dimensions are L. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit crazy. But it, 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 such a thing exists. Uh, one not that satisfactory aspect, topologically speaking, is that there's no relation in this infinite family uh, other than that each 
of the manifold is 11 dimensional and each manifold is uniformly triangulated. Uh, any given cell is surrounded by some constant number, say 55 cells. I guess I'm confused by the <laughs> sign of what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's L, not L squared, rather than L fourth, not L squared? Oh, oh I mean, right. no, nominally you would have L squared area. Right. But the total volume is so small, or put differently, the systole volume is so large. Oh, okay, so you're saying it's the air? Okay. Yeah. Oh, and for a physics audience, the good LDPC codes a new family of Hamiltonians, a bit more, more wilder than the cubic code we have seen. Uh, Elia Portnoy at MIT constructed, well, constructed a procedure where that converts, uh, given an LDPC quantum codes, it, gives, gives, uh, it maps it to the 11 dimensional construction by Friedman Hastings. And he puts this 11 dimensional thing down to three dimensions and then stretches and fills holes and things like that. And you obtain some three dimensional Hamiltonian. And there, the, the minimum operator you have to enact in order to transform one, one ground state to another, you, the, the number of sites in that operator is order L squared. So it's a three dimensional system. It's like a, you may think of the topological theory where the Wilson line loops exist. In that case, the minimum operator you have to enact to, to have a transformation would be order L. Now, everything is now surface-like. There's no smaller dimensional one. For the cubic code, it was mar you know, barely greater than just L, L to the 1.001, 1, 1 something like that. But it's L squared. That's the best possible. This log factor got removed like uh, three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, so, and additionally, they have shown that the energy barrier, the, the environment has to put into the system to implement this uh, uh, logical transformation must also be order L, far exceeding the log L bound by violating the translation invariance. So there's something interesting going on, although well, it's been only three weeks old, so I don't, I don't have much to say, but there is something going on. Okay, maybe I, w I should conclude with this slide. Uh, this is uh, 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 the landscape of, or historical development of the, all the gapped Hamiltonian systems viewed to, from the air accretion perspective. Um, we have known for a long time that, that there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking phases and there the degeneracy of the ground state will depend only on the symmetry group. Uh, and when, uh, it, speaking in terms of uh, classical error correction, it's just a yeah, uh, classical error correction. There are a uh, group many uh, ground states and everything is protected. You can uh, put the, uh, well it is spatially very homogeneous. It has a prong symmetry. And uh, we know how to take the thermodynamic limit and discuss any physics around that very well. For these topological theories, the degeneracy is no more a function of symmetry group. Well, there's no symmetry here. It's just a local symmetry. And it, it gives a very fine manifold invariant. And it gives us quantum code, like a Tori code or higher, higher dimensional analogs. And it is very spatially homogeneous. The rotation, translation, and those. And we know how to take a thermodynamic limit. We know how to write down field theory. We're, we're great. Fracton enters, uh, represented by the Shaman model or the, my, the, or the cubic code of my work. Degeneracy is no more manifold invariant. It requires a finer information. It, it, it knows something about the system size, the extreme UV detail manifest in the ground state degeneracy. And it's an error correcting code. And spatial homogeneity is slightly degraded, uh, it, but at least it is trans now translation invariant. If you ask me about the thermodynamic limit, well, if there's a fluctuation of ground state degeneracy, how would you take the thermodynamic limit? Well, uh, mathematically speaking, that's fine because you only get to work with the local operators to which every local, uh, uh, every ground state looks exactly the same. There's no, it's an error correcting code, so there's no correlation between the local reduced density matrix versus the global state. So thermodynamic limit is well defined in a very precise sense. Now, from, from like a three weeks ago of work, now the degeneracy is user defined. Whatever degeneracy you give me, I just give you the Hamiltonian associated with that. Um, 
it is a quantum error correcting code. Special homogeneity is broken, probably far less than translation variant. I don't know what to put there. And we have, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know anything about the, 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 the phenomenology of those models, but there, there must be one. So maybe one of you in this audience should be able to come up with a nice story around it. Uh, I will conclude here. Thank you. Reason that 11, 11 is special? Is that related to string theory? <laughs> no, it, uh, they wanted to uh, impose very nice conditions on their manifolds. They're simply connected, and there are many other properties. And to, to, for that to work, you have to work in a sufficiently high dimension. And the naive construction gives you like a five or six dimensional thing, and then you embed it in the higher dimension and, and blow it to make it smoother. So 11 is not. In, in, it's not important in, in, in any, any meaning. Well, I don't understand this very weird behavior of going from 2 to the p to the 2 to the p plus 1. Uh -huh. So if you take a, a large, very large volume and yeah. you sort of chop off one surface of it, uh -huh. how does that so sort of suddenly make it that you can move things around with much less, uh -huh. much, much, much less something? I would, I guess <laughs> Uh, first, you have, if you chop it, then there is a lot of boundary degrees for freedom that you have to gap out. And that's a highly non-trivial task. Um, and uh, another thing I can say is that increasing system size by one is, is by no means an uh, adiabatic process. It's radical change to the system. Uh, the origin of that is, uh, it can be attributed to the fact that when you want to, so where does the degeneracy come from? You implement a certain operator around the system, and when it comes back, it will annihilate the vacuum. And that operator is an observable underground space. Now, how? To go all the way around. Right. But how would you construct such an operator? It, it obeys a certain rule, and that rule is so strict. It, it doesn't, it, go, it, it requires more than just saying that, oh, your operator should be continuous. It's more than that. So that's the origin of rigidity. new phases yeah. uh, that have just been discovered, you, you said that there's an order, uh, an extensive energy barrier to go from one logical state to another, Yes. Uh, but you don't know anything about the thermodynamic stability. Ah, so uh, what, what competing effects are you worried about? So uh, already in the cubic code, the similar thing happens. The, there is a growing energy barrier, but at the same time, at the, same, at, the, at the given energy, there are many other states of the same energy. So the entropy of that energy sector is high. And that, that, that is a competing factor. Here, I think the similar thing is happening. So it's not, I think it's not going to be self-correcting memory in three dimensions for the reason that the operator itself is high weight. It's, it's, it, it, forms, it should form a, a, a plane. But at the smaller length scale, there's a lot of room to wiggle. So entropy factor goes like, volume to the volume. So exponential volume, log volume. So that log factor is growing faster than linear. It makes it uh, faster than linear, so it just, it just destroys everything. That's my impression so far. So I guess for the case of the uh, quantum low density code, uh, um, no one has to like, say, understand that like, say, they can have like, a set of collective property that say like can't code at all, like uh, code would have. Uh, uh, LDBC, well, you can certainly talk about that, and it probably it obeys the self-correcting uh, uh, behavior. However, you're already in the high enough dimension. Then, you know, you should, your, your contender is like a 4 yeah. Okay, Create a uh, complexity of reading out the states. Oh, reading out. States are, are very well protected. Ah. How, how do you, uh, oh, oh. Um, <clears throat> a good question. Uh, 
Actually, in any uh, error correcting code based on the, those poly operators, the reading is trivial. You measure everything in a one basis and you post process, that's all. Um, the, the reason behind that is actually the uncertainty principle. You only get to measure only like X or Z, not both. So, but once you fix what you're going to measure, you don't care what happens to the, to the other. Where, where does your work on flow codes fit into this? That, that was going to be the next and next like a five or seven, seven slides, but I stopped. You have a one <laughs> sentence word? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, maybe I wanted to say this, that, uh, um, well, yeah, the, well, for those of you who have heard about the flow case codes, uh, there is an automorphism going on based on this measurement dynamics, and that implements uh, a version of time crystal. And the one interesting feature is that you don't need any disorder to make it work. You know, typical time crystal or any flow case dynamics, phases of those, uh, you need some mechanism to prevent the system from heating. You have to kill off all the resonances, and that's why you need uh, some disorder. But here, since it is an error correcting code, and you are measuring out the qubit, uh, measuring out the part of the system every time, there's no need to manual. Well, yeah, then no well, this, this disorder can only help, but without it, it's okay. Uh, so it is uh, another way of thinking about the, those working phases. If you if it is error correcting code. And it's you know the, the the all the questions about uh, MBL just you know it's okay not to think about it in this in this setting. Okay, so that's another window to to look at the flow case dynamics.